Five months ago in October of 2023, Frank Martel joined me on stage at Housing Wire Annual. We had a phenomenal, transparent conversation about his new role as CEO of Loan Depot and progress toward his Vision 2025 plan. In today's episode of Powerhouse, we're bringing you a live recording of this conversation. We call these sessions Battlefield Playbooks, and this is a taste of the interviews that you'll experience at The Gathering, Housing Wire's tent pole event, which is coming up on April 21st through 24th in Scottsdale, Arizona. This year, we made a big move of merging Housing Wire Annual with the Real Trends Gathering of Eagles. This event brings together executives from across mortgage and real estate brokerage under one roof. This is the opportunity for learning. It's the opportunity for developing commercial and business opportunities. This is the most powerful room in housing. I hope you enjoy this live interview with Frank Martel, CEO of Loan Depot. And I'm thrilled to welcome Frank Martel, CEO of Loan Depot. Thank you for joining us, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's have a seat. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> So Frank, arguably you signed up for one of the, the hardest jobs in housing, joining Loan Depot in 2022 as CEO after a really successful run at CoreLogic. And if I understand the background correctly, starting as CEO, CFO, the CEO to CEO at CoreLogic, great run, and now Loan Depot. So tell us about the decision to come out of retirement and take on this, this challenge of leading Loan Depot into the future. Sure, yeah. I had probably one of the briefest retirements in history, about uh, a week and a half. Um, <laughs> and uh, that was a bunch of trips to, uh, to uh, Home Depot <laughs> in the supermarket. And I, I quickly realized that retirement wasn't quite for me at that point in time. So uh, I recalibrated and actually uh, had a wonderful opportunity to come to, to Lone Depot. Uh, as CEO of CoreLogic, had a lot of exposure to Anthony and, and the Lone Depot team. Really admired the team, smart young, aggressive, energetic, and so uh, really appealed to me the opportunity to come in and, and work with that team. Um, and also, obviously, uh, um, the market is the market, and Absolutely. it changed dramatically, and uh, uh, love a challenge, and uh, certainly it's been a challenge, but uh, it's been a rewarding one, and uh, I've really uh, loved every minute of my uh, now 18 months at Home Depot. So shortly after you joined, you announced announced a vision for the future and looking forward to the next few years. So, so tell us about what you, in 2022, when you joined the company, what you wanted to achieve with this business and then how, or, or if not, how has that vision changed as we've gone through the last 18 months? Sure. Yeah, look, I think as any CEO, um, one of my jobs and, and a CEO's job is, is to have a vision for the business and to look forward, not just today, but tomorrow. What's tomorrow going to look like? And how to position the company for success in the longer term. And so we put into place a Vision 2025 program, which really looked at where we want to take the company as we go through this cycle um, and, and come out the other end as a stronger, better, and more successful company. So put that into, into place. Um, you know, the market has changed a lot. I think it's legged down about five times since I've uh, joined the company, and you have to react to that and adjust to that. So the Vision 2025 was built to have a little bit of wiggle room in it okay. uh, and to adjust it. Um, and it's a lot about you know, addressing and resetting for today's reality, but also looking at you know, what are the opportunities out there for tomorrow. Um, and you know, housing is a huge uh, asset class, biggest on the planet, uh, complex, ever-changing. And uh, that's one of the fun things about uh, being in the, in the industry is to be in that kind of ecosystem, trying to figure out how to bring better solutions uh, and how to promote sustainable home ownership. So it sounds like you had a lot of exposure to the business and to Anthony through your time at CoreLogic. As you looked at the business with an objective lens as you were taking this new executive responsibility, how did you evaluate some of the strengths of the Loan Depot business and the areas that you needed to, to bolster strength to be able to achieve this vision 2025? Yeah, look, I, I think, uh, um, um, first of all, you know, Anthony and I are, are tremendously complementary. So I've learned a lot from Anthony. And, Tell us uh, about that. What, what's the compliment? What, what are his strengths and yours? How do they complement each other? Well, if you look at what he's achieved in terms of building a company from scratch, um, and a big company, an important company, and one full of talented people, uh, it's remarkable. Um, I've, been, you know, I've been in private companies, public companies, and uh, 
uh, big and small and medium sized ones. So I've had a little bit broader, I think, exposure, especially now we're a public company, absolutely, to what the public markets uh, uh, look like and what they what they demand. So uh, so we are very much complimentary. We we interact constantly. Um, and he's got a real vision for what the future looks like, and uh, and so do I. So we kind of work work on that together, and uh, it's worked out great. I mean, we we just uh, re-upped our our strategic uh, vision into 2026, um, and I think it's really exciting to look at um, as we get through this down cycle, which we're still likely to face a tough market in 24. Uh, I'm I'm. I'm feeling pretty good about the, uh, the the rebounding into the into probably the, the spring selling season in 25, um, and so uh, uh, you know we're working to make money in this market, and then as the cycle turns, um, to build the company and uh, and accelerate growth in a uh, in a profitable, sustainable way. Okay, so Vision 25 is extended out to 2026. I'm sure there's some iterations in that. What are the, the changes from Vision 2025 to this, this extended plan? Like, and you said you, you built in some wiggle room, so you know, learning more about the business, learning about the, every new dynamic the market hands sure. us. How does the vision evolve? Yeah, so you know, what, what we're looking at now is what, what investments should we be making? Because you know, investing in the business and the infrastructure and the capabilities take time. Yep. So where should we place our bets? Knowing that those will come to fruition toward the end of 24 and 25, uh, and we are investing in uh, both fundamental uh, uh, underlying systems of record like the LOS platforms, but also looking at point of sale because as as we talk about in the public market, the future is going to be about the home buyer of uh, the the first time home buyer. Um, you know, yeah, we talk about affordable, and there's a lot around that, but certainly the first time home buyer of the future is going to be different than you know, what we saw in the past. And so they're going to require um, different solutions, uh, different inter interfaces. And so we have a lot of investment going into how we interact with them, how we make them successful homeowners, um, and how do we make the experience a little, a little less painful and more, uh, uh, and, and more productive. So when you think about, as a CEO, the, the near-term and long-term investments that you make in the company. I think of near-term and loan origination, whether we're talking about recruiting or, or lead gen, the investments that can pay off in, in quarters, not years, and then technology and infrastructure and ops, it takes like a longer time to achieve ROI. How do the, the public markets kind of perceive the, the strategies of investing near-term and long-term, and, and how, do you, how do you manage that, that narrative so people understand the path you're going on in terms of capital investment? Sure. Um, well, look, as a public company, everything is laid, laid bare. So all your financial numbers, <laughs> everything yep. is, there's not many secrets in a public, uh, uh, from a financial point of view. Uh, strategically, obviously, we, we, we talk about it in a, at a high, high level. But, uh, but look, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, um, the important thing in this kind of market is not to try to play to a stock price, because investors have a view of this sector in general. Every company has a low valuation, and, and certainly in mortgage. And, and uh, there are some winners currently in the housing market that are doing better. Uh, but by and large, housing finance is not an industry that's getting a lot of airtime from an investor point of view. That's just a reality. I think you know you can try, and uh, a lot of things go into that. I think uh, uh, what people are looking at is the companies that are going to come through this as winners. And that's where I think that uh, uh, the money, you know, you'll see that um, as the, as the cycle eases a little bit, you'll see that reflected in stock prices. But I know there's no silver bullet. Um, and I think uh, the other thing I think as a public company CEO is you have to try to lay out the vision. When, we came, when I came in and we talked about Vision 2025, a lot of companies in the, in the housing market weren't talking about their plans. Um, and, well, they were uh, still riding, riding high on that origination wave of 2021 and 2022. Yeah, I think purchase a little bit had so a little bit of, of room left. I think refi, you know, refi was a cataclysmic d decline, um, and and Lone Depot had a heavy exposure to refi. So uh, that was a little bit adding to the challenge that we had uh, um, in terms of resetting the organization. But look, we put out there a very specific plan and talked about reducing our staff counts. Uh, nobody likes to reduce staff counts. Um, but you know we had to do it, and we did it, and we did it in a transparent way. And uh, um, you know we're we're seeing that come to fruition now as we head into 2024, 20, uh, um, a much better financial situation. 
Um, and uh, that will ultimately drive valuation and, and, and public market credibility. One of my favorite podcast episodes that, of Housing News, which I host, was with Anthony, and he talked about investing in refi when the, when the market is there and the, the value that it brings to the, the homeowner and the, the U.S. economy when we're able to help a large number of homeowners lower their cost of, of housing finance and their, their, their cost of shelter. So there's a big case to be made for how important it is to be able to put the gas on in the refi market when the opportunity is there. But our industry celebrates purchase so much, and we know that the relationship with the home buyer and seller is so incredibly important. As you think about Vision 2026, how do you think, um, is, there, is there a balance and an equilibrium point between refi and purchase that you aspire to, or is that just a, you, you ride the market and take opportunity when it's there? Yeah, I think the finance, financial instruments that support home ownership, to me, they're just tools in the home ownership journey. Yep. And so as I look at it, you know, the people that we're going to be serving going forward are different. Um, Gen Z, millennial, the millennials are entering first time home buying, you know, in force. They're going to power the market the next 25 years. They're different. You know, their income structures are different. You know, um, their, their use of technology is different. Their financial literacy is different. So I look at fundamentally that interaction and the support of the home buyer as critical. And I want to own that, that home buyer through the life of their home ownership journey. So my view is refi plays a role in that context, obviously, as you look at you know, managing the home ownership journey. So we have four channels. So we have diversified channel structure. So we're able to play across all those spectrums. Um, I think the, the opportunity for us is how do we do that in the most efficient, lowest cost way um, so that you can ride the cycles that are inevitable in housing. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, I think that's where a lot of focus on our longer term vision is, is how to play that, that role. But also, I think we're doing a lot on the, as I mentioned earlier, on the POS platform. When you engage the, the, uh, the home buyer of the future, what does that mean and how do you interact? And it's going to be both, to me, personal and also technical and technology driven. So we're working both those angles. Can, can you paint a picture for us about what that technology ecosystem, brand narrative, communication channel, like how, how does that work to solve the, the needs and desires of this next generation home buyer who may have different income streams, different expectations of technology, different expectation for how they interact with brands like Lone Depot? Sure. Yeah, well, look, we have a great servicing portfolio, for example. So there's many answers to your question, Clayton. But I think uh, you know, we have many interactions with uh, vast numbers of uh, customers, both customers and potential customers. The challenge in housing is that you know, as a mortgage company, you, know, you get a lot of leads, you talk to a lot of people, but that all falls away. So we have to figure a way to better manage our contact strategy so we have an investment around a... Uh, you know, the platform that the, the repository around the customers so that we understand them and then apply things like uh, artificial intelligence to look at life events and how do we, how do we mechanically know, you know, somebody's going to have somebody likely in college and how can we reach out to them on, a, on more than just a, you know, a, a, you know a, an outbound dialing for dollars type of a mode. So uh, we want to know everything that we can about our customers uh, have it in a modern uh, format, uh, and then be able to use technology to mine that data uh, to play a role for them. Uh, right now, HELOC is uh, a huge area of, of uh, growth for us, um, but that's, that, that's a manifestation of the fact that people have a lot of uh, home equity trapped in yeah. their properties, and hey, it could be a, you know, either debt consolidation or other, other factors um, uh, that they, they tap that. A lot of people don't even know that. How do conversion rates look like on HELOC right now? I'm hearing commentary from loan originators that there's a lot of interest in, in tapping home equity and the app, they go through the application process and kind of get to that, that payment and that seven and a half or eight percent like sticker shock starts to kind of come into the picture when you realize how expensive accessing home equity can be in this environment. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, look, we, we, we do have the ability, you mentioned earlier, you know, we, we can do refi. Um, conventional refi or we can do a home equity loan. So we have, we have a couple of choices depending on what the right solution is for the home buyer. Um, we have great up, uptake. So, you know, that, that, that product line has grown dramatically over six months. 
to where it's a significant contributor to our financial results. So, uh, and that's projected to continue. So the demand is there. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we, we uh, connect those home buyers to other solutions as well. But the demand is definitely there, and we're seeing a, a, a good pull through and an expansion pull through. Um, and so uh, we expect that to continue for the foreseeable future. Is the um, HELOC interest uh, equitable across channels? Are you seeing that interest in retail and, and consumer direct? Like, how is that conversation coming to the picture? Yeah, well, we're fortunate because our we have a really good consumer direct channel. Uh, really uh, great, great, great crew there, and so uh, they're leading the charge very definitely. Okay, um, but the volumes are spread between the two the two uh, conduits. All right. So as you think back on your experience at CoreLogic and do you ever, are there experiences or knowledge sets that you're, you find yourself falling back on now that are influential in the way that you lead and set the vision for Lone Depot forward? Yeah, look, I think CoreLogic was really, you know, a data centric, so it was really a housing data. Um, I think there's a lot of richness there that can be applied in underwriting. Uh, a lot of data that we don't traditionally use in the underwriting process. Um, that can not only help us to be more informed about the lending process, but also help the homeowner understand yep. the property they're buying. So we, I, I think there's definitely a lot to be learned about employing that data. You just have to have it in the right platforms that people can digest it because it can get, can get overwhelming. Um, but you know, the fact that today we can see three-dimensional, uh, um, um, three-dimensionally interior, exterior of, of prop, most properties. Um, and is, in a lot of cases, we can take uh, people through that journey of, you know, putting their own furniture in there and looking at the stuff. And it makes it a richer, uh, more engaging uh, uh, process. And hopefully it creates more opportunities for revenue for us down the track with other services. Because uh, if you look at the life cycle of a, of a home ownership, it's very long, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, and getting longer. I mean, it's yeah. like the, the average time in a home has not been, um, has been getting longer over the years, driven yeah. by a few factors, COVID, home price appreciation, affordability, but uh, people are staying in their houses. Well, you hear all the time, you know, the rate lock effect of having you know, 80%, 80 plus percent of, the, of the, the mortgages out there that are 4% or less. Um, and so people don't think they can move um, because of the interest rate differentials. But uh, um, um, and that is part of a current problem we have, yeah. um, but uh, but that will change as well. So tomorrow, Logan Motoshami and Sarah Wheeler are going to be on the stage debating the mortgage rate lockdown theory. So uh, we'll bring some of that perspective <laughs> to stage. But while, while we're talking about the housing market, you you shared that if I, if I heard you correctly, that your uh, optimism doesn't really start until till 2025. And we've heard some other views from the market from, from analysts and forecasters that there's a, you know, a potential to see purchase pick up, refi pick up, and rates come back in a more normal band in 2024. So tell us about your expectation, expectations for the housing market um, as you steer this business forward. Yeah, look, I think that, I, I, don't, I don't think I have to tell this audience, this, this cycle is so <laughs> different than past cycles. Um, and I think that what we have to look at is, is when is the cycle going to turn and how is it going to turn? Um, it's unlikely, in my opinion, to be you know, the Fed tweaks you know, rates 50 basis points and we get a, a refi wave. It's just there's a lot more challenges in the market. Um, I spent time in D.C. with the regulators and you know, housing availability, housing stock availability is a massive issue. There's just not enough of it. So how do we get housing stock availability and get everybody working together to solve that problem? Uh, we have relationships with key builders around the country. Uh, that's an area that's doing well. Existing home sales, not so well. So we got to figure out how to unlock that. Um, I just think that that bodes a slower uh, uh, rebound, not quite the, the refi wave that saved the industry you know, over the last 10 yeah. years or so uh, here and there. Um, that's why we, are, we do have a significant purchase capability in the company, uh, which we're building, uh, because um, home purchase is a you know, more fundamental decision and life, life event, I think, for most people. So uh, it's a bit stickier. Um, so we want to have that virtual cycle, being able to have those two channels driving both purchase and, and refi. And then, of course, we have a half a million or so uh, uh, um, clients in our servicing portfolio, so we're a major servicer, and 
you know, that cycle can be, can be recycled. So, uh, so we're looking at how to do that, but, but it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a challenge. There's, I don't think there's a snapback. Uh, but as I said earlier, the thing about housing is it's such a massive asset class. So there's opportunity everywhere. We talked about HELOC, and yep. that's something that uh, we launched in July of last year, or in the space of 12 months, is a significant contributor. Um, there are many other opportunities like that on the home, home ownership journey. From a business perspective, as much as I would love a snapback, I think a snapback is, could actually be a very challenging dynamic for the long-term sustained recovery of the housing market. We might find ourselves in a situation with a snapback where home price appreciation shoots through the roof again and we're back in a scenario where the Fed has the housing industry, housing sector in, in, the, in the crosshairs. So like, hopefully a snapback um, isn't exactly where we, we land. I, I like the idea of a moderate recovery that like, gets us back to a healthy place. Well, if, we, you know, if there's a refi boom, you know, I think we're, we're going to be positioned to take advantage of it in an yeah. efficient and productive way. But, uh, um, and look, it's a tough world out there you know, in, with inflation. You know, um, and people that can remember inflationary times, it's a very difficult, you know, the Fed is fighting a, a good battle there, in my opinion, uh, to bring inflation down. Um, they have some tools to do that, one of which is interest rates, yep. which they're employing. Um, you know, the question is, you know, the NBA issued a, um, um, a letter uh, talking about the fact that the housing market's being penalized for, you know, and the rest of the economy is doing well. But, but the issue is fundamentally is to fight inflation, and that's going to take a while, in my opinion. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, rates that are pushing 8%, and uh, um, I don't see an easy or quick decline there. Um, but I do see some moderation once we can see more stability in the, in the trend there. But look, I think again, I, I think the housing market, you know, it's so fundamental to people's lives. We are seeing the biggest demographic shift in history with the baby boomers exiting and the millennials and the Gen Zers. And so that, that creates a lot of opportunity for change. Um, and we have to change to capture those opportunities. So I think, thank God we have a lot of technology that's coming on stream. Um, Got to figure it out. Um, and what uh, things like artificial intelligence can do for the housing market. Um, and then look, we have a regulatory uh, situation that's uh, complex uh, with a lot of regulation and the, and the, and the um, people looking at, uh, you know, policies make looking at what, what is sustainable, what is safe and sound for this industry. A lot of people losing money. What does that mean? Um, the good news, I think, is uh, they want to support players like Loan Depot. So we had very productive discussions with uh, um, with the GSEs and the other regulators about how, how, how they can do that in the context of Loan Depot, but I think in general that applies to the whole industry. That's, that's great to hear that there's support from regulators. because I, I think the, the, the topic of breach and repurchase has been so front and center at this event and in the industry for the, the last several quarters. Um, it doesn't always feel like the regulators have, um, uh, or, yeah, you know, have the support of the industry top of mind. They've heard the message loud and clear. I can assure everybody of that. Um, look, we took a lot of hits last year. Um, that's, in, again, part public record. Um, you know, our quality is really, really good now. Um, and so that's helping. So the, our, our, our repurchase activity is dropping as a result of that. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot of footfalls and things that don't make a lot of sense to have to repurchase in the scratch and dent markets punitive and so uh, um, you know a lot of companies are employing different strategies to manage that that exposure um, including ourselves but uh, but fundamentally you know high quality good interaction with it with the uh, the the counterparties is required to, to try to minimize the impact um, I think they get it I think they get the fact that they're looking for the industry to be liquid and have plenty of capital but Forcing all these repurchases is, is counter counterbalance to that. So uh, um, it's just a, a matter of you know they've got their own people that they're serving, and and nobody likes to take losses. So uh, um, so it, it'll it'll I think it's getting better, but it'll take some time. Frank, thank you so much for joining us here at Housing Mar Annual and for sharing your expertise on stage. I really enjoyed it.